somebody to read the next slide. Let's see where we're going with this. Okay, we're do the cultural competence. What is cultural? What is cultural competence? Let's just, just identify quickly. Anyway, just read it. The integration and transformation of knowledge about individuals and groups or of people into specific standards, policies, practices, and attitudes used in appropriate culture settings to increase the quality of services thereby producing better outcomes. Stop. Let's look at it in, in the culture of Dedicado Treatment Center. You being us, being providers, what does that mean? Thereby producing better outcomes. You two just spoke of it. What is, what, understanding that we have patients that all see life differently, all coming in sometimes with the same condition, you know, drug addicted, alcoholics, However, they're seeing in them, what would produce a better outcome for them in your interaction? Just give me a framework. Just give me just one statement about what would produce a, a better outcome. Seeking yeah. to understand versus Seeking to understand. understand. What else? Huh? Empathy. Powerful, powerful word. Trying to listen to them. I can't even leave this word yet. Without empathy, there can't be any cultural competence None. that can be lived out because I will never consider you. And without, without benevolence. Love the word. Without benevolence either. Huh? Without benevolence. You showed empathy on Sunday. You allowed someone who came in who's hurting from her experience to make this a more normal experience for her to let her cook. They, her peers, loved it. Benefits was happening. Of course, patients can't be cooking, but we had a chef in the kitchen with an adult person who's from an Indian culture who wanted to do something for her peers. And you took the role as I'll, I'll be there to make sure that safety isn't being disrupted. That this isn't an everyday thing, but I'm going to normalize her experience. I'm going to help her to feel more at home here and more at ease based on the traumatic experience that she just came from. Mm. That's being culturally competent. That means I'm going to be empath. I'm going to apply empathy to this. I'm going to practice empathy so that I can bring her closer. Because if I can create more intimacy, we have more effectiveness. There's more trust. We are in an environment that without trust, you guys hear it every day. How many people come to our treatment center where you hear where they, how they've been treated and where they are? Almost every one of them. We hear, we hear it so much. And I, the basic thing we hear are two things. First of all, they don't trust nobody. And there was no service ever given to them. They come here, sometimes they even scratch in their head. Is this even real? And if you read the reviews, yes. you're going to read, and most of them, Dr. Marshall and Miss Liddy made us feel like family. But you guys do too. Don't, don't, no, no. It's just it's all you guys. Well, yeah, they yeah, talk yes. about the team. I'm, you know, I wasn't right. trying and to blow yes. you up. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, I know that. But, okay. no, yeah. but understand something. In order for this, in, the, in the, what we do here, as providers of services for drug and alcohol counseling and some therapy, trust is, the, is a fundamentally an element, a, 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 a process that has to be here. It has to be right here before the consummation of this process can come to fruition, meaning the full complement. It, it can't mean anything if I can't connect. So being culturally competent encompasses not just race, and that city, it, it, it evolves around everything about that person's experience. And that key word you use, empathy. I want everybody to understand. Empathy. Empathy. Hopefully, by learning this, this now brings more of your gift of empathy up. Because you can't work in this, this, this type of setting without empathy. It will not happen. The system, again, of help will expose you. I heard how uh, Julia share uh, in a meditation one day how she was in tears because she was so grateful how the staff here poured empathy into, into her recovery, how where she came from, she never even thought of that word. Right. You know, if nothing was happening like that where she was from. And that that's that's a, that's really good feedback. Because me and David have been talking, I'm going to me and David have been talking about the uh, the culture of community among staff members, 
And so that's why I said first, I'm gonna take responsibility from the very beginning that because I've been pulled in so many directions, I haven't really been identifying specific things we can do to create community. But the one thing that is still happening, and I appreciate each one of you for it, is that the service, the mission that we're on, is still being expressed. Something I heard the client say the other day that you did, that I think was, was, was outrageously awesome. They said this girl lost her brother, but she came up here not doing her work hours, asked us what we wanted, went and purchased it and came back. So the two variables is that the displacement of service and the example of getting out of yourself when you're in a bad place. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I think it was a little bit more therapeutic for me too. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. No, no, no. Believe it or not. They didn't see it that way. <laughs> All three of us sat in the pool and we just talked for a while, you know, and we just, you know. Believe it or not, when you, when you talk to me and Lily, we were also, in a way, I kind of knew the principle of service without even mentioning it. That when, it, when even though you want to, it was suggested from us because we realized that the principle of service still is the principle of service, and it always has a way. When we're of service, it always has a way of also helping us to feel better about ourselves. Yeah. So, so I appreciate you guys still keeping the principle of service because that's the number fundamental value that we have here as a culture in Dedicado. This is one I never want compromised. Never. If you can't. If you can't tell your own brother, your mother, your sister, or someone, look, you need help, uh, hey, I, I, I'd like you to come to Denicado and get it, then we have dropped the ball. We are not doing it right. We're not doing it right. And that's the questions you have to I can, I will bet my, listen, I will bring my own son here <laughs> to treatment if he had to come to treatment because I believe in the idea that we are trying to impart something in other people. Okay, someone else read the, the next one. What is cultural competence? Oh, Bob, I think Bob had it. Oh, I'm sorry, Bob. Yeah. I'm sorry. It's, it's okay. Uh, it's just I want to advance it off something Robert talked about because it was very important in what happened today. We had a group, and uh, two of these started talking about the situation and everything. And I have a good working knowledge of Native American culture. And I think by having that, and by having a good working knowledge of a number of different cultures, not only was I help, able to help her be able to understand what she was going through culturally, as well as an individual person, but I tried to make it more open and apparent to her peers, who were already sympathetic, but I think they empathized more by the end of the process as to what she was going through, because I do have some knowledge, and the only thing I can do with that knowledge is to add to it, to get more from Inter interacting with them and the peers to be able to find out what that's all about. That's, that, that's great. That's a right. that's that's intentionally being competent to know that you want to ha have let her have an experience that will create the environment of trust for her. That's really trauma informed care. You know, guys, this has everything to do with trauma informed care. And that's what we're providers. How do we mitigate um, the potential for trauma? That's just to understand each other. Okay, so the ability to think, feel, and act in ways that acknowledge, respect, and build upon ethnic, social, cultural, and linguistic diversity. Cultural competence means that I'll respect you. I may not agree with how you guys put your pants on. <laughs> I may not agree with the big hair or the small hair. I may not agree with any of that stuff. In other words, the, 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 the point is, being culturally competent means that I know that when I meet you or when I meet the patient, we already have differences. We have differences based on race. We have differences based on religion. We have differences based on beliefs. We have differences based on educational levels. We have differences based on how we grew up, what we find valuable and not valuable. We have to respect the word you use, uh, that word, respect. You gotta respect it. And guess what? Principles don't ask us if we like that or not. You gotta like them, you gotta respect them. You gotta respect it. If you don't respect it, what, what, what happens if we're not culturally competent? Confusion. Inconsistency. The ideal of service can't happen. Our primary vow, goal, will not be met. Which will not be met, right? And the patient, instead of being benevolent, there's, 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 there's this hurt, right? Somebody read the next one. This is real quick. This one. The awareness, knowledge, and skills needed to work with others who are culturally different from ourselves in meaningful, relevant, and productive ways. 
the ability to work effectively across cultures in a way that acknowledges and respects the culture of the person or organization being served. And that's what we're doing now. We're intentionally bringing this to light. Our incompetence to some degree, I have some, we all have some, to some degree in understanding culture. It's to some degree we all are ignorant, meaning lack of knowledge, to some degree of each other, right? We have to admit that. So we're intentionally practicing and being intentional to understand that there are differences on the table when we walk in. And our patients, in order for them to get the best of our service, we have to be intentional to be competent enough to, one, understand that they're different, two, to understand that us working together, we have differences too. And if our differences are in what they call in, in, in clashing, and not creating community amongst us, we now, we inhibit their growth. Because invariably, they're gonna be affected by how we interact and behave with each other. If we have problems with each other, we really should take our problems outside the patient who comes in already with their own problems, and even exacerbated, if you will, based on their drug and alcohol use. We take our differences to another room and we try to work it out so we don't project the energy or project the indifference that we might be having onto the patient who is looking to us, who needs us to encourage them, to inspire them, to fill them with some hope. They need that from us. It may sound corny, but it's not. Read so many reviews. There, are, there is some identifiable impact based on what patients are saying after they leave here, okay? And in addition, there's some benefits that you have as a team. Um, I always say that we become their entertainment because they notice how my free facial expression when I turn away from you. Right. They're reading my body language because we're dealing with survivors. Wow, right. great point, Dave. And when, when you're interacting with each other, when you could raise your awareness of each other's strengths, now we can be strength focused. And we begin to interact with each other from our strengths, and we begin to complement each other because my lesser strength may be your greater strength. <laughs> I, I just want to hit that real quick. Verbal and nonverbal, very powerful. And I'm going to show you an example. Me as a kid growing up, my mom had a way of not seeing like she was paying attention to me when I would try to talk to her, especially when I was hurt. She didn't mean it, she wouldn't try to do anything wrong. Me as a kid, I've learned through my self-exploration that I internalized it that it didn't, I wasn't worthy. I didn't mean anything. So even to this very day, now that I've learned how to take care of myself, instead of projecting my anger, let's say if I'm talking to you and a person is not paying attention to me, I just simply shut down and say, well, go ahead, you can either say, no, no, I'll process that. that I need your attention. If I don't got your attention, I'll just let you finish and we've got some time and we'll do it. Where before, in the past, I would get mad, I get an attitude. So that's why when I, when I went into therapy, I would tell my therapist, look, I know a lot of therapists write notes while they're writing. A lot of them do this on the computer. If me and you are going to do this, I, I, can't, I, I can't talk to you that way. So I took care of myself right up front to say, hey, I need to know that you're not because, but there's something, do you mind if I write down while we're talking or whatever? I think that's and also somebody, a matter of knowing your needs. And somebody can do that. Yeah. That was, too, that's, that's what my culture gave me a mindset that I wasn't good. Of course, I've overcome some of that in my own change. But that's how powerful and blinding not being competent can be and not uh, and us not caring about each other, okay? Um, do you, all right, so the cultural comment, the awareness and knowledge and skills need, okay, the ability to work effectively across cultures in ways that acknowledge and respect the culture of the person's organization is being served. So we're serving each other, we're serving the patient, and we're serving who? No, no, no. So? Who licensed us? Oh, oh. The state. We're serving the state. We're serving the Commonwealth of California, the Commonwealth of the people of California. We're trusted servants. So we have to practice benefits. We have to always be looking in their best interest. This that we're learning in the day and the trauma informed care we do all year. This is our minimal responsibility. Minimal. To become aware that we are not aware. 
That's minimum we can do in order to practice benefits. So believe me, we're serving each other, but we're also serving other causes that are bigger than us. Okay? Um, Somebody read this. One can be aware of likely areas of potential possible for miscommunication, misinterpretation, and misjudgment. Anticipate their act, their, their, occurrence. their occurrence, knowing what can go wrong, and have the skills to set them right. We have a word here called transference and countertransference. Anybody kind of understand what uh, uh, transference might mean? Let's say our patients come in. Say you're in recovery. What, what's, a, what's a common thing that could come up for you in a relationship to a patient? Because there is a competency here that has to be, be looked at. Give me an example. If you're in recovery, then you see somebody that's in recovery and they've experienced some of the same things you have and you begin a process of identification with that person. Or, look at this, guys. This is going to bomb in the room. I have to drop. Let's say that you haven't become well-versed enough in the ideal of stages of change. And you're not taking the initiative to really understand fundamentally how do you conceptualize what the stage of change is so I can be more effective with this patient. So because I don't know and learn it and don't understand how to part, truly practice it, patient comes in and is acting out. And let's say they are truly in the contemplation stage of change but with a whole lot of other baggage. But because I've been through recovery and I think I got the answer, I want to kick them out right away. I don't want to practice love and tolerance. They ain't using, they ain't drinking, but they acting a fool sometimes. And, and they're acting a fool may remind me that that's how I used to act someone in my life. Right. Hey, Dr. Marshall, I think we should kick them out. Well, what it is, well, they still keep eating M&Ms in their room. <laughs> they're laughing, but that's the truth. <laughs> they won't get up when I tell them to. They won't get up when I tell them to. They won't come to group on time. Well, they be Am I practicing benefits because my default says, oh, they don't want to do it my way? They don't want to do it this way? They got to go? That's bizarre. I actually expect them to come in with certain behaviors that are what? If you're in recovery, what will they say the root cause of our disease was? Selfish and self centeredness How many of you here, well, I'll say to some degree, I'm selfish. Oh, yeah. All right. Okay. Let's keep it real here, right? What? So, transference or the ideal is some one of these patients can kind of touch a button in you. May, might mean that there's some things unresolved. There's a, there's a confidence piece here. Cultural. The culture of drug and alcohol treatment. You're in recovery. They're trying to get in recovery. You think you have the answers. They can't hear the answer. Are they wrong? Or are they at a stage where maybe they can't receive it yet? Or is there an intervention that you could provide that may stimulate some awareness that they may grab onto? I Tolerance. Had, I had a men mentor share with me that we're not surprised when people act out. We're not surprised when people relapse. Right. We're surprised, surprised when they don't. Right. Yeah. Yes. We're surprised when they begin to straighten out. We say, oh, you're still around. <laughs> right? And in that way, no expectation. Mm -hmm. I come into this thing knowing that they're very fragile and that there's a lot of variables. So what can I do to help them and not hurt? And part of that is detaching from. And again, I have to say a problem mostly because our retention rate is high. It, it is a good thing about it. Sometimes it's that little thing at the end where they all leave at the same time. But in reality, they don't leave. They usually stay here, and that's all because of service. Okay, somebody read the next one. We're, we're a few slides, left and we're done. Come on. One can, somebody read that. One can be able to gain a broadening of perspective that acknowledges the stimulus. Simultaneous. Oh, Simultaneous. sorry. Simultaneous. Simultaneous. We already read that, right? No, we're at the bottom. We're at the bottom. Oh, okay. One can be aware of likely areas of potential cross-cultural miscommunication, misinterpretation, and misjudgment. Anticipate their occurrence, knowing what can go wrong, and have the skills to see set them right. We did read that. Yeah, yeah. So one one other comment is that I can always walk into a situation if I'm culturally competent. I have to realize that there will probably be some differences, and there will probably be some 
what appear to me misconceptions may be some, I may conceive, I may have a concept of something my way, and you may have something your way. There may be a misconception, there may be some misunderstandings going on because I'm not becoming aware, I'm not practicing empathy, or don't want to understand that you might see it differently. I have to already know when I leave here, guys, and I go to CVS, I have to be ready to know that whoever I run into, they have a culture and they have ideals that are different than mine. You know, and if uh, I know this, it's kind of like going in the battlefield ready. I, I think there was a situation where you and I were doing a group together, and there was an example of a difference, and we displayed in front of the clients how we had a difference, and you said, no, no, I'm glad you did that type of thing. So I think all of those examples are still demonstrating to the patients. That's right. Mm -hmm. and, so, and the reality is, um, and you probably heard me say this in previous training, is that the only tool I have is a hammer. And everything will look like a natural. Everybody. I got one way that I deal with everything. Either that's, you know, making myself a victim or it's, a, it's blowing up your name, whatever it is. If I need to expand the toolkit. That's right. So my read right through this. Come on. This is Peterson's developmental model. I'm just trying to articulate something that's already been done. Concepts that have already been created. I just want to articulate. Somebody go read? Awareness, consciousness of one's own attitudes and biases as well as the socio-political issues that confront culturally different children. Knowledge, accumulation of factual information about different cultural groups. Skills, integration of awareness competencies to positively impact children from culturally distinct groups. Attitude, belief that differences are, available, are valuable and change is necessary and positive. In his model, he's referring to children because our formation of culture and the formation of how we think and how we behave starts in childhood. Begin. Um, it begins there. But if you were to use even the idea of the awareness, knowledge, skills, and attitude, we do a biopsychosocial assessment here, right? right? And that is to become competent about the patient's experience, not the one you want them to have, but the one that they're actually having right now before they come in. We even have a section on our... Um, biopsychosocial that talks about culture, asking them, are there any cultural things that are significant that you would like to discuss with us about? Gives us more information and more knowledge based on their perception of the world so that we can help them through their lens and not the one we think they want or need. Remember, the patient is the expert in his life. Right. The patient is. We may not think that, but they are. And the more trust we can build with them. Go ahead. Sometimes it's a process of asking questions too, because it talks about you know, in the previous slide it said uh, uh, you want you don't want to make an assumption that you know something. It says I might may say my understanding of the way it is in your culture is that this occurs or this takes place. Am I getting it right? Is that right? Is that how you see it? And they might tell me something different, but that gives them the the, the ability to say, hey, well. You're wrong, but I understand you want to learn this. I want to understand you want to get this. So I'm going to tell you what it really is. Right. And you and make be, it an open door rather than this is what it is. And be very careful when David <laughs> talked about verbal and nonverbal expression. Be very careful to stay very neutral. That you might hear something that doesn't agree with your ideology, your culture, how you see the light. Because once you give a facial expression that may, let's say, be unfavorable to them, Trust is gone. Immediately they're going to shut down. Yeah. You have to provide an environment of safety so when you hear something that doesn't agree with you, you can simply receive it without any nonverbal expressions. Okay? All right, let's go to these also. This is what uh, the competence includes self awareness, cultural understanding, multiple perspectives, intercultural communication, relationship building. Flexibility, adaptability, intercultural facilitation, conflict resolution skill. These two are very important in here because, and remember, we, we come in, we notice these differences. What's your idea? What's your idea? Where can we meet? How can we agree even to disagree, if you will, because I don't think there's a disagreement. You believe something, I believe something. But what's, what's going to be effective in providing the services here? What's going to be effective? So you got to remember to go in always looking for, for answers and solutions, not the ones you think you have, but how are others looking at it too, how they see it, okay? Uh, multi ultra organization developmental skills. And these are the, what they call, these are got Peterson's uh, levels of becoming a cultural proficient. Anybody know that, what it means to be proficient? 
well versed in any level of cultural competency. Yeah. You know about a bunch of different cultures, you get different uh, basic concepts about how they live their lives, what they react to, all of those things. Without being culturally competent, that's impossible. Though. And to be culture proficient doesn't even mean I need to understand everything about your culture, but it means that once I meet you, I'm not making opinions about you right away based on what I saw on the news or of what course. I saw uh -huh. on the street. Of I'm course. immediately going into this relationship that I don't know, and the only way I'm going to know is to ask. I know that I know you. So there's cultural competence. So there's a cultural destructiveness. That's the ideal we see in, we, we see in society all the time. There's cultural incapacity. There's cultural blindness. Can't even see that I can't see. That I keep looking at the guy with the lawnmower, right, mm -hmm. as a gardener, right? That's, but no, seriously, no, I'm, I'm being honest. <laughs> then I went to school in front of these guys on gardening companies and, 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 and corporations and stuff. And the, but people would attach a label if you see somebody, this was me coming to California, very culturally blind, right? Then you have cultural pre-competence, cultural competence, cultural proficiency, okay? The six levels of understanding, just we'll read them real quick. Yeah. Somebody read that real quick. Cultural destructiveness, the dehumanization of specific cultures or individuals to define an underlying bias toward the superiority of the dominant or majority group. That's racism in its rawest form. Go ahead. There is an intention to ignore issues affecting minorities and promote policies and standards that have an adverse impact on them. Okay. Second one, cultural capacity. Remember, I just threw the levels. What's the what's cultural incapacity? The inability to work with diverse populations. <laughs> There is not an intention to ignore issues or, or promote policies and standards that have an adverse impact on minorities. Instead, the practices are based on a lack of understanding and ignorance. This is scary here because this is a person that is stuck in, or in rigid is what you call it, no attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors and will not move outside of their thinking. They simply will not accept the reality that there are differences. This is a, this is a scary place to be. Well, when you're around people who are what they call culturally incapable of accepting and grasping that everything isn't the way you see it, the way you learned it. There are differences. That's all right. Come on, go to three. This is for the person who pretty much doesn't even know that they don't know. Go ahead. Somebody else, somebody else. Somebody else read, come on. And the cultural blindness approaches used by and for the majority are perceived as relevant for all others. Practices are adapted to the greater good, which is generally majority perspective. The level is characterized by an inability to examine or even recognize existing biases and, and approaches to practices, education, and research that perpetuates and perpetuates the continued existence and development of models that supports stereotypes of diverse populations and thus further promotes prejudice. Give me an example. Give me a real example of this real quick. Cultural blindness in our in our society. There's only one way to do it. Well, this is disparity in education. There are some who are more privileged to a higher level of learning and some are not, right? Yes. If we become sensitive to this as a, as a, as a, a, an American culture. We design programs and set up systems that will also help the disadvantaged, if you will, to get some of the things that the advantaged or the privileged people have. We can put the ideal of race on it, but there's a disparity between just an income level, social economic settings. There are people who come from poor settings, and there are people who come from rich settings. Some have the money, some don't. That's almost Culture, like a scholarship bed versus an insurance bed. Right. So I give scholarships here, right, because I know people can't afford it. There's a few reasons. There's one, I know they can't, and I know that treatment at this level, when it's small and it's intimate, has more value and more impact, as opposed to opening up a 40-bed nonprofit. If I'm going to be true with myself, I already know that that doesn't work. It doesn't mean there's no altruism in my behavior to want to help those people. But if I'm going to look at it as a model, it can be helpful for the person that's totally engaged. But somebody at that contemplation stage and experiencing lots of ambivalence, that bigger group, they, they already a lot of times are isolated and hidden in society. I can easily hide in the group and not even be involved. Yeah. So this environment does promote, it's more effective when it comes to the trust and the intimacy, right? Um, four, pre-competence. 
I'll read that. Cultural Picasso, the recognition of potential weaknesses and bias between the practices and the decision to take action to address the problem. Uh, the problem. Although this phase is a positive movement, false comfort may sit in after making only minimal efforts to be responsive to diverse populations. The efforts may only be peripheral and not sufficient to truly address the cultural issue. That's not common for us. We do a lot of trauma-informed care training. You understand? It's not like, okay, we're going to get this one identifiable piece of learning, and then that's it. Next year, you know, it won't stick. We're doing trauma-informed care along the way all the time. Although we call trauma-informed care, cultural competence is a piece of trauma-informed care. Do we do what's in the best interest of the patient, understanding that the patient, what? has a cultural and an ideology that's all of their own. If we accept that and we practice to be intentional to assess their needs based on what they need and not what we think they need, but we can be suggestive in how we treat them, then the ideal of the pre-competence now we're being competent. We're continuously trying to explore their reality. Okay? Cultural competence is the last piece here. Cultural competence, they demonstrate a commitment to a diverse population in all aspects of Aspects of the structure and function of the organization. The commitment is characterized by sustained systemic integration and evaluation at all levels of significant collaboration with the diverse population into the infrastructures of the organization. It's intentional. I'm intentional. This is intentional. You are intentional. They are intentional in my thinking. I don't do anything in here without really trying to consider you. If you think that's corny, that's up to you. My wife will take it. Every night I'm praying for you guys. Every night. Every night I'm asking for wisdom and guidance on how I should deal with you when I'm feeling something difficult and I'm having a struggle with maybe a behavior or whatever. Sometimes i got to make the hard decisions, and sometimes I don't want to make the decision because I just want to see people grow. I have people like David who also pushes me on the side to let me know that, unfortunately, i got to now treat this job right now that I've, some things that are balancing out my life on principles and not feelings. You know what I mean? So I'm trying to be intentional to look at you all differently because you are different, but accept you for who you are. Okay? So I think that's it. Um, well, proficiency is the is demonstrated by the centrality of the organization's commitment, our commitment, and diversity by its external expertise, leadership, and proactive advocacy in promoting appropriate care for diverse population. We're doing that now, and we're doing that most often as we're going along. That's what we're doing right now. And this... Uh, Progress along cultural company complement requires a continual assessment of the organization's ability to address diversity. I don't really, it's simply, this is the, the complement. We're continuously practicing how to, be, to treat each other, how to also treat the patients, again, through empathy, through respect. That's what all this is about, okay? Um, I think that we're going to end it right here because I think